Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, consultant in clinical neurophysiology at the Luton and Dunstable Hospital, and this also incorporates Bedford Hospital as well. And in this talk, I'm going to let you know how we use our QSense in order to help patients achieve a diagnosis of small fiber peripheral neuropathy. First of all, may I apologize for my absence in person, and also this is a pre-recorded presentation, it's just the tail end of the Jewish festive season. And if there are any questions, you're very welcome to email me um, and I will get back to you uh, later on in the week. I will end up sounding like a salesman at some points, uh, but I have no financial interest to declare for any of the products or the companies that are gonna be mentioned. Um, I do think it's all fantastic stuff and do go and speak to the salespeople um, outside about um, getting these. Um, but um, you know, I have no interest to declare. Let's talk about some local statistics. So in my hospital and group of hospitals, we merged in 2020 with Bedford and our combined catchment population is about 700,000 people. Our department received about 2,800 referrals in the last year for general nerve conductions and EMGs from a very wide range of referrers. And looking through the letters about 25 to 30 per year, um, we'll either directly request small fiber testing, usually via neurology, or report symptoms that could be suggestive of a small fiber neuropathy, and we'll come onto that fairly soon. On the basis of those clinical symptoms, um, I then filter those through to me, and then we'll do some nerve conduction tests and, and a variety of other things too, including thermal thresholds. And at the end of it, we diagnose about 12 to 15 uh, cases a year, given that the reported incidence in the literature is between one and 11 per 100,000 per year. We're roughly in the appropriate ballpark. And so I don't feel that we are over-diagnosing patients either. In terms of referrals, um, I think that under-referring is a very common theme in epidemiological studies because it's under-recognized by community referrers, and that's very much our experience because most patients' diagnostic journeys are on average two to three years before a diagnosis is made. And they're often left with a feeling that they're somehow making it up, and that often relates to the great disparity between the severity of the symptoms that they report and the paucity of visible signs. And I think it's incredibly helpful for patients to receive their correct diagnosis, even though therapy can be challenging and quite limited because at the very least they can be believed. So some useful reference terminology from the IAS, IASP, the International Association of Pain. Um, so there's allodynia, that's pain due to a stimulus that does not normally provoke pain. Dysesthesia is an unpleasant abnormal sensation. Paresthesia is an abnormal sensation which is not unpleasant. There's hyperalgesia, which is increased pain from a stimulus that normally does provoke pain. Hyperpathia is a painful syndrome, so you've got a variety of different aspects to this and may concur with allodynia and hyperesthesia and hyperalgesia and dysesthesia. And then there's causalgia, which again is another syndrome, but characteristically including sustained burning pain, allodynia and hyperpathia. So in terms of the clinical symptoms that I'm looking for on the referrals and when I'm discussing things with patients, is looking for a history that commonly uh, includes burning discomfort, usually affecting the feet. It's often worse at night. There's an intolerance to having bed sheets or anything over the feet. There may be other symptoms too, whether it's itch, restlessness of the legs, skin color changes, dry skin, and there may be also small diffuse symptoms as well, which may also depend on what the underlying etiology is, dry eyes, dry mouth, perhaps if there's a Schergen's, orthostatic dizziness, bladder or bowel dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, and so on. Signs um, may be dryness of the skin, erythema, or some other less uh, specific things like shininess and edema. It can often be very useful to ask patients if they've got any pictures of any intermittent skin changes too. Clinical tests, often, obviously we explore for large fiber dysfunction and uh, we can test for vibration, proprioception, and reflexes and so on. But specifically on the clinical examination, it's useful to test for pinprick, cold perception, and sometimes we do a skin wrinkle test too, either water immersion or with EMLA, particularly if other tests uh, end up being negative. So in our neurophysiology lab or any neurophysiology lab, it's very straightforward to be doing the standard nerve conductions and the EMGs, largely to ex exclude large fiber peripheral neuropathies or radiculopathies. It's fairly straightforward to do sympathetic sweat, sweat responses as well. Personally, I would say if the skin is very visibly bone dry, I don't think it's particularly helpful because they'll just be absent anyway. And conversely, if the patient's already quite sweaty, the responses are gonna be present anyway. 
Cutaneous uh, silent periods can be very helpful as well, looking for delay in the onset and shortening of the CSPs. And then we come on to thermal thresholds, which can be deployed in a variety of ways. We look at thermal perception of cold and warm, but you can also look at thermal pain th uh, thresholds as well. And you can change how you do these test paradigms as well. And you can also do CHEPs depending on your equipment and your software. In terms of thermal threshold kit, um, we have the original MEDOC TSA2 or TSA II, as it might be easier to, to know it as now. Um, with this kit, it was very much a water-based uh, thermode system. It could test the extremities from 0 to 55 degrees, and it also had some additional modalities which you could also test too, like vibration sense as well. But there were limitations with this. Um, it took a long time to get the equipment going. Um, often you have to make sure that the water levels were properly filled, otherwise um, things could uh, short out, and then you'd have to get the technicians in from across the world. And so although the Medoc TSA II was pretty good at what it was doing, um, the company saw uh, quite rightly the need to improve things. And so I don't know the exact date where it came out, but we got our Q-Sense in 2020 um, and they moved on to an air-based thermo system. So it's basically, it's a glorified air conditioning unit. And the range is small in terms of the temperatures. It goes down to 16 degrees or up to 50 degrees. And so it can elicit heat pain, but it doesn't go down to really cold induced pain. However, the benefits of this are that it's pretty quick, it needs minimal maintenance, and it's just very fast to run. More recently, the company uh, brought out the new TSA2, which is again a liquid-based one, which has got a variety of different uh, attach attachments and modalities, and it can do CHEPs as well. And there's, there's something sort of in between that and the Q-Sense, which is the TSA2 Air, uh, which has got the expanded temperature range, so you can do your cold-induced um, pain um, assessments and um, it's a faster rate of temperature change too, uh, but it doesn't quite have the portability of the Q-Sense. So our Q-Sense um, has actually been exceptionally handy. We are a very generalist service, and so we're only really looking for abnormal perception of temperature thresholds, and that certainly occurs within the range of 16 to 50 degrees that this uh, piece of kit offers. Now, it's a small device, it was designed to be portable, and therefore on the back end of it, it actually has a carrying handle. And what we realized was that it can actually be integrated while there are existing Daymed EMG carts, which is absolutely wonderful because we have a highly pressurized and busy service. So our standard appointment slots are about 30 minutes and efficiency is an absolute premium. So combining kit together allows us to do this more seamlessly. It allows us to have more floor space and we can combine all the reports into one very, very easily. As I've mentioned, it's an air cool system. So there's essentially minimal maintenance required, servicing or even recalibration. We've had our kit now for three years and it's never failed us. There are some caveats before I start showing you how we use all of this, um, and those are really involved with communication. You need to be able to share a language with the patient. You need to be able to convey and have the patient understand instructions. Perhaps you might need to have an interpreter doing that, but actually you lose a lot of nuance if you're not doing it in the same language. Um, paying attention, which works in both ways, is very important, both in terms of the patient and the person doing the, the test too. The patient has to know what they're expecting as well. And of course, there can always be uh, malingering involved because these are not always objective tests. So let's just look at the first example here, paying attention and knowing what to expect. So it's a 20 year old uh, lady who had symptoms and signs of erythromyalgia in the feet. Now, sometimes this can uh, be associated with small fiber neuropathy. And so we ended up doing some thermal threshold tests. And in the first run, uh, warm perception was normal, but cold perception was abnormal, quite clearly so in the first leg. And so we moved on to the other leg as well. Warm perception was appropriate, but cold perception this time was absolutely normal. And so I went back and I redid the first leg that I did, and actually it was normal as well. And so having spoken to the patient about this, it was relating to 
her not really knowing what to expect and paying a bit more attention to what was going on. So it's really important that you communicate very clearly with the patient about what's going on, what they're supposed to expect, and you know, pushing the button at the appropriate time. The next example is a 65 year old lady who um, had breast cancer, she had resection, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and ended up having burning pain in the feet following chemotherapy for a period of about three years. On examination, she had reduced pinprick and cold perception in the feet. She had normal standard nerve conductions and EMG um, on a, a couple of occasions and had in fact been labeled as functional. You can see here in the first example here from her hand, it was absolutely normal. She had perfect perception of heat and cold. And when I went down to her legs, and this is just one of the, her legs, she had clearly abnormal heat and cold perception. And so it was very useful for her to get this diagnosis. And I'll also say as well that she had um, abnormal um, CSPs as well. Another example of someone who had very uh, clear symptoms, this time affecting not just the uh, feet, but also into the hands as well. Um, we have very clear abnormal perception of heat and cold, mainly in the legs and to a lesser degree in the hands. And that's quite a common pattern to encounter where the legs are more affected than the hands. In this next example, I just want to share with you that it's really important on checking on what is being perceived. So this is a lady who is about 70. She had very typical symptoms, both a small fiber neuropathy and restless leg syndrome. In her hand, which is an example on the right hand side, she had normal perception of warm and cold and everything was comfortably within the normal range. For both of her feet, however, her perception of heat was at the upper limit of normal and a perception of cold was on aggregate at the lower level of normal. And when I asked her what exactly she was perceiving with these stimuli, she had no perception of warmth. What she was actually feeling was pain. So in other words, she was going straight to pain and bypassing any perception of warmth. And for her feet, she was experiencing dysesthesia rather than a true sensation of coolness, which is what she was able to very clearly describe in her hand. And so it's important to bear in mind that even if tests can be within normal range, it depends on really on what the patient is perceiving and when they are clicking the button, because clearly here, this particular patient um, had a small fiber neuropathy, but she was activating um, the system to stop giving further um, temperature stimulation by her abnormal sensations, uh, which was generating discomfort. So it's just important to check on what's being perceived and you can't just let the test run on and uh, do it blindly. You have to be constantly interacting with the patient and checking it is on what exactly they're feeling. Straight to pain in a small fiber neuropathy patient, I think can also be an objective uh, sign too. Um, and I was going to show you a video, but I'm just a little bit cautious about how far things um, get shared. And I thought it'd just be easier just not to share the video itself. But some patients can end up with an actual objective sign of pain um, where they totally bypass the sensations of warmth. And in this type of scenario, they have absolutely no perception of temperature change and they go straight to pain. The patient can look quite hurt by this. And if you do this multiple times, there is no habituation of the response because they've got no warning. All they're suddenly getting is pain. And these patients have got absolutely no anticipation that it's about to happen. They're just waiting there quite blissfully and suddenly you'll see their face grimace and erictus of pain. And I think sometimes uh, the pain assessment side of this can actually provide some very objective data too. Having said all of that, um, sometimes we can get some very tricky situations, particularly with patients who've got hyperesthesia. So in this particular example, someone had pretty sim um, typical symptoms for a small fiber neuropathy. They had also had um, abnormal uh, cutaneous silent periods as well, but normal sympathetic sweat responses. And in this example in the hand, um, it was plumb normal, they had normal perception of heat and warm, but for the legs, they actually had um, hyperesthesia and um, various dysesthesias occurring very quickly um, when cold was presented to the feet. And although here, very strictly speaking, it's well within normal range, 
their perception of it was not. And that's a very tricky situation to deal with. Uh, and that obviously requires further more specialist type of studies than what I can uh, provide. So um, in summary, what I would like to say to all of you is I think that thermal thresholds as a modality are a very useful addition to any department of clinical neurophysiology. I think they are very straightforward tests to perform and to integrate with the standard studies that we all do. Over the years, both the software and the hardware have been significantly improved and enough for a lot of flexibility and are very reliable pieces of equipment. I hope you don't mind me saying, but both the company and the local distributors here in the UK are an absolute pleasure to deal with. Um, and I highly recommend Miguel and um, please do go speak to him in the break. And um, I think that ultimately making an appropriate diagnosis is very significant for patients, even if it may not necessarily lead to any very specific treatment being given to them. You'll often find patients, once they've been given the diagnosis, burst out in, into tears because it's such an emotional thing for them to actually have something that they can take with them as a label and to be believed because the symptoms of small fiber neuropathy can be exceptionally intrusive. I hope that's been a useful little overview of how we deploy our thermal threshold system. And you're very welcome to email me or pick up the phone uh, during the week and, and speak to me as well. Uh, and also if you want to see a video um, of what the straight to pain objective uh, sign I'm talking about is um, you're very welcome to be in contact, come visit me uh, and I'll be very happy to share that with you. Um, and I wish you all the very best. Keep well.